sacred knowledge and a spirit of free inquiry. Uh, so when Muslims appeal to the past glory of Islam, they do so by invoking the names of such luminous scholars as Ibn Sina, Al-Biruni, Al-Ghazali, Ibn Rushd, Ibn Taymiyyah, and Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi. What many Muslims don't realize, however, is that these scholars disagreed with each other, and sometimes vehemently. So this talk engages the puzzle of appealing to a diverse intellectual legacy to establish claims of greatness that were possible in the spirit of free inquiry while simultaneously rejecting the legitimacy of diverse perspectives in the transmission of sacred knowledge. It's proposed that the tension between the authority of sacred knowledge and openness to rival truth, truth claims can be respectfully engaged, if not entirely reconciled, through the framework of a liberal education. Uh, we are beyond blessed to have the Dean of Zaytuna College, Dr. Mahan Mirza, to help us explore these ideas and more. Uh, Dr. Mohan Mirza is the Dean of Faculty at Zaytuna College. Uh, having studied traditional Muslim interfaith and secular academic settings, he engages in the study of Islam from multiple perspectives. He's taught a range of courses over the years, including introductory Arabic, Islamic religious thought, Western religious traditions, the life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a history of the science and Islamic societies, Hadith, and the Quran at institutions from Yale University, to the California State University, to Chico, and the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Mahan Mirza is also a visiting, visiting scholar at the Graduate Theological Union of GTU, which is in Berkeley. And without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Mahan Mirza. distinction that we make uh, at the college between local scholars and cosmopolitan scholars. And uh, this is this term, these terms are generally employed in, in our profession, where a cosmopolitan scholar is someone who tends to go out more and derive their legitimacy from places external to the institution. And a lot of their activity is, uh, is, is connected to, um, uh, to what happens outside in either the scholarly community or the community of uh, praxis. Um, the local scholar, like myself, is tied to the institution uh, on a day-by-day -day basis. I spend most of my time there. Um, I, I work uh, in my office. I deal with student issues, faculty issues, uh, planning, uh, short-term and long-term, um, and, uh, and pretty much the, uh, the daily uh, affairs of the college, including uh, quite a bit of teaching. So. Uh, why did I, how did I end up here? <laughs> we got an invitation, um, and I was told that Imam Zayn was requested, um, and he couldn't make it, he's always very busy. So the, um, the invitation floated among us, um, and it came to the office of the Vice President, um, and she said, Mahan, why don't you go? And uh, they're looking for a Zaytuna scholar. <laughs> so I, as soon as I heard that, I said, yes, 
um, I'm going to take it because it, I immediately uh, wondered about what what is a Zaytuna scholar? Like I wanted, uh, I was intrigued by that uh, by that kind of invitation, and I wanted to think more about it. So I thought this would be an opportunity for me uh, to do that. Um, you know, you don't typically um, uh, probably uh, see this kind of invitation go to, to other institutions like say Harvard. Like you wouldn't call someone uh, in the administration and say, "Could you send a Harvard scholar uh, to come and talk uh, at our institution?" You might get um, Alan Dershowitz, or you might get Noam Chomsky. Um, you, you don't know who you get. And so, what is it with Zaytuna? Um, uh, do we have uh, an institutional identity, uh, and what is it? So that well, that's one question. Now, when I look at the faculty, and I'm the dean of faculty, and I work very closely with the faculty in teaching and learning. Um, in uh, 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 design of curriculum, uh, make sure that the faculty have the resources that they need in order to succeed um, in, in, uh, in what they're trying to achieve, the outcomes uh, and the le learning outcomes in particular, and also their own personal development so they don't stagnate. Um, it's really a rich faculty. So maybe I'll just, uh, since it's a small enough group, I wasn't sure. Uh, if it would be a giant hall with uh, 300 people coming to Chicago, if it would be like five people. And I was prepared for both. So this is uh, somewhat in the middle. We can make it a little bit interactive. So how many of you know what kind of faculty we have? Where are they trained? Anybody? Any side? Where, what would a typical Zaytuna faculty member be like? Yeah. Very traditional uh, Islam. Right. Okay, so I think you know, study traditional Islam. How do you define that? Uh, a scholar who kind of doesn't change the transition. Yeah, so it's a, a, with the Isnat. So okay. you study from an authority, who studies from an authority, and you can draw these you know links, mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. and you have typically what's conferred is an ijaza, license to then further teach. Um, and when you think of Zaytuna, uh, we also have a program on Saturday called Living Links. Um, which is based entirely on this idea of uh, the links of transmission, how important they are. Um, so yes, that is a kind of scholar that's at Zaytuna. And the founders um, uh, are of that kind as well. They are traditionally trained themselves. But well, Zaytuna is a liberal arts college. That's what we say. So how does that work out? You don't have to answer all the questions. Um, but you know, I invite you to think think about that uh, with me. And if you look at myself, you know, I say in my bio, I study in a traditional setting. Uh, it was in Lahore, in a rivalist school, and we had a traditional alim who came and did some usul al and hadith with us. But my degrees are, in, you know, mas my master of arts is in um, the study of Islam and Christian and Muslim relations. I did it from a Christian seminary, Arkhan seminary, and I did have Muslim teachers. Um, Ingrid Masson was one of them. Uh, she's a Chicago. Uh, person, I don't know if you might be too young to uh, have a related, you know, uh, a connection to, to her. Um, but she graduated from University of Chicago. She was president of ISNA for years, and she was teaching Harvard Seminary and, and others. But I was at Christian teachers, and then I got a PhD from Yale University. Uh, my advisor was a Jesuit, so they all left. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm okay here. <laughs> uh, and my other, my readers, two, both my readers were Germans. Orientalist, you want to use that term, right? And um, uh, that's how I've been trained. But I'm at Zaytuna. And um, then we have uh, non Muslims on the faculty. Uh, we have Mark Bell, he's Catholic. Uh, we have Cindy Alsek. And uh, sometimes we don't ask uh, you know, how um, uh, an instructor identifies uh, in terms of their faith um, as long as they're respectful. Uh, we have uh, faculty who have been trained in Deoband, faculty who have been trained in Northwest Africa with, in the Arabi Deen. And then we have faculty who have trained with individual scholars. And then we have faculty who studied at Cornell, Stanford, uh, Yale, Berkeley, graduate theology. So it's a mixed, mixed bag, right? Um, and we do have an institutional identity. So I think there is, uh, you can say, say tuna scholar and mean something, which would be different from say Harvard or uh, a scholar say at a secular institution. But I, what I want to do is think about what that means and with, with all of you together. 
And the way that I'm going to do that is through the prism of diversity. And, um, and in the description that you read of, of the talk, that we, we exchanged a few different ideas, Western tradition, sacred knowledge. Uh, I floated the idea once, I don't know if uh, uh, you remember, wither the greatness of Islam. <laughs> and that idea is embedded in this paragraph. Uh, you know, when we say that the oh, Islam was such a great uh, uh, intellectual tradition, we had even seen a Zadi, Ibn Bush, and uh, they were uh, not friends. They wrote against each other. And they even declared each other, in some instances, outside of the fold of Islam. Right? Um, so, um, uh, how can we appeal to that greatness? Or can we appeal to that greatness? Yet still claim to follow a certain chain, to a certain line that sets itself up against one of the other uh, uh, intellectual persuasions of our past that nonetheless contributed towards that greatness. So how, how are those uh, relationships uh, then uh, negotiated, right? Um, and in our title, I have uh, Negotiating the Tension Between Transmission of Sacred Knowledge and Spirit of Free Inquiry. Because when you think of a liberal arts college, you think of spirit of free inquiry, uh, open-ended discussion, doubt, questioning, right? All right, so, uh, so much for framing. The, what I do want to say is that um, difference of opinion, whether you like it or not, is a fact. It's human nature to disagree. And I'm sure that people disagree among, uh, among you all in the MSA, uh, let alone outside the MSA. People disagree within the Hanafi school. And we know that we have different schools, Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, and there were others beyond that. And then there are differences between Sunnis and Shias, and there are different schools among the Shias. Always been there. And then we haven't even gone to the philosophers um, and um, uh, maybe you know, the mystics, although they don't have to be mutually exclusive. We were, I was reading the Federalist Papers one of them with uh, the rhetoric class, and it's James Madison. And he argues in there, um, he's, he's dealing with the issue of factionalism, right? That faction, that when you have a democracy, you can uh, split into factions and voting blocks. And then the one faction can, uh, by uh, just a majority vote, uh, become, uh, you usurp the rights rights of others, or my, and not not give minorities their rights. So how do you negotiate? You maintain uh, a baseline of decorum in a democracy where everybody's rights are preserved, and factionalism doesn't lead to this chaotic disintegration. That's what he's dealing with. So he says, all right, factionalism is there. Now either we can get rid of it, and if we can't get rid of it, proceeds very logically. We have to mitigate its effects control its effects. So he said, in order to get rid of it, we can only do one of two things. Has anyone read the, the paper? There's only one or two things. Either we get rid of political freedom, so then people won't have uh, the opportunity to speak their minds, and there will be no factions, just impose something on them. And he said, well, that's not smart, right? Because that would negate the very foundation of, uh, of democracy. So the other, uh, the other option is to change human nature. That's what he says. Uh, just, you know, you carry away to free. Uh, but that's, that's not in human nature. So we can't get rid of it. So we have to control its effects. And then he goes towards republicanism. Um, and he does that very interesting. So, uh, uh, even in our tradition, we've had difference. I've pointed out some, and you know some of these stories. I'll mention just a few to uh, make it even more clear. There's the one story uh, I know you know of uh, the Banu uh, Qurayla, right? Oh, where they, um, the Prophet ﷺ sent a group to Africa to the tribe and said, "Pray Asr when you get there, over there." Right? You, you heard this one? It's very interesting. So. 
uh, they go there and uh, the time for Asr expires or is expiring before they end, before they're in um, uh, at their destination. So they say, let's pray, time's running out. One group among them says this. Another group says, no, the Prophet said, you get there. We're not there yet, so uh, let's just pray when we get there. His rule overrides, he's you know, the one who's explaining the law. And they said, no. Um, what he meant was, try to make it in time so that you, the prayer time is still there when you arrive, so you can pray Asr over there. But you know what? We didn't do it. We were too slow. He didn't say that the prayer time changes for you today. So now what do you do? And the interesting thing is, both groups want to follow the Prophet. Right? But who's right? Human nature. And so uh, each group did what they thought was right. And they went back and asked the Prophet, and he didn't uh, give an answer. He let the question be. It was a very interesting indication. Um, we have um, a number of other uh, cases like this from the Sirah that are uh, quite telling. Um, and uh, a story from more recent times, one of my teachers, he was telling us that they were building a masjid in Karachi. And so one group said, you know, we're going to follow the sunnah this time and make it from date palms and, you know, earth. <laughs> uh, and this is how the Prophet's mosque was. <coughs> what do you say to that? Hard, hard to argue against that, but something doesn't seem right. <laughs> right? <coughs> yeah, but... And so another group voiced, I think, what many of you are thinking. <laughs> they said, listen... How you know the sunnah isn't just to use the most conventional economic uh, materials at your disposal. And so that's what they had, and that's what they did, and this is what we, we have, this is what we do. Which one's the sunnah? Right? It's, a, it's an interesting, it's an interpretive question. And you have differences uh, of opinion among American jurists all the time. How to interpret the Constitution. You know, is it uh, a living document? Uh, do you go for original intent of the founders? Uh, how do you do this? And they disagree. This is why you have uh, major battles when you appoint uh, 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 jurists to to, uh, uh, to the Supreme Court, for example, because interpretation plays a key role. It's the human condition. And Muslims suffer from it. Or maybe use a positive term, you know, enjoy it as much as everybody else, <laughs> right? We, we do this. And so when we say, oh, we don't agree, uh, and that's a problem, uh, wait a minute, we just said, we were so great, look, Ibn Sina, Biruni, Ibn Arabi, uh, they never, they didn't agree. One of them said, you're not a Muslim, if you believe these things. And they had conversations with each other in texts, sometimes direct correspondence, as Biruni and Ibn Sina, Sometimes uh, they responded to each other's words, as Ghazali, Imam Ghazali did to Ibn Sina, and Ibn Rushd did to Imam Ghazali. And sometimes they met each other, like Ibn Arabi met Ibn Rushd in childhood, uh, this is an exchange between them. And uh, sometimes they uh, just corresponded over long distances, uh, over centuries, and responded to each other. Okay? So, um, what, now what do we do with this difference? Now, I'm not arguing that it's all relative, and everybody's fine. No, you still have conviction, uh, right? You still have conviction. So what do we do? Um, that is the question. Um, maybe at this point, I'll say a little bit more about, uh, about these individuals. So in Islam, the question comes down to, how you understand God's revelation, right? God spoke, and we saw in the example of the, the prophets as he was, that he had, his, he had his words, but they disagreed. I just thought of another example I wanted to tell you, so I'm going to go back to another example. This is from my own experience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the moon sighting. 
Um, so you know there's a difference on moon sighting, whether you should sight the moon um, or whether calculations are okay, or whether you go with your home country. Now, initially, they, they came up with the calculation idea of the Fifth Council uh, recently, about five years ago, or, or seven, eight years ago. Like, I know um, uh, it was in the 2000s. And they did it so that uh, Muslims could unite, okay? <laughs> because prior to them doing it, or I think that's one of the reasons why there should be predictability and people can take time off and so on, but also so Muslims can unite. Because prior to them doing this, <laughs> you used to have two Ramadan, starts Ramadan, two Ra'id, almost inevitably always two, right? Uh, one would be those who go in the home country, one would be with those who go with the moon side. And I remember the year they introduced this, we had three. <laughs> oh, no, I, I swear. Because their, the birth took place really, really early, and none of the others had gone yet, so they went first. And then came, you know, those who went with certain countries, and then those who came who, who saw them. It was really interesting. And so, in my mind, you can have conviction. And there are scholars who argue their conviction. Sheikh Hamza has argued his conviction very eloquently in Caesarean moon birds. It's compelling. But having said that, you can have that conviction, but still agree to disagree, and also still embrace a higher order unity. We all fast. We all go by the moon. We all read the Quran. We all celebrate Eid. Yeah, you know, you read it a little bit differently than me. And that shouldn't be something that splits us apart. This is my opinion. Have re respectful, healthy debates, right? But to say that the difference is itself a problem is challenging history, it's challenging human nature, it's challenging uh, uh, it. Yeah, it, I think it's, uh, uh, that that's, uh, we can't do that. So. We can still hope, and you should argue that you know you, you can be persuasive enough to con convince people to a certain point of view. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, um, maintain a healthy distance as well. Respect the right of, of the other person. And um, so, in our in our history, when I mention all of these people, you know, Ibn Sira, Ibn Sina, Al Biruni, um, they lived uh, about the same time. They were from. Uh, Central Asia, uh, Khiva today, or Bukhara um, in modern day Uzbekistan. And then they ended up going uh, their own way. And there's a correspondence that was preserved between them. It's called Question and Answers. Al Askila al Ajwara. And Biruni asked if you've seen a number of questions on Aristotelian cosmology. Because uh, according to Aristotelian worldview, you know, things have essences. Uh, the spheres are arranged, arranged in a certain way, um, they correspond to intellects, and uh, there's natural motions, so heavy elements go down naturally, earth and water, air and fire move up naturally, and uh, the heavens have always been this way, because they're in perfect motion. Right? And the whole philosophy, and even metaphysics, is associated with this type of uh, cosmology. So Biruni writes Ibn Sina questions and he says, listen, uh, how do you know that the movements of the heavens are not forced? How do you know this? How do you know they're essential? How do you know that the heavier elements naturally move downward? Maybe everything moves downward and the heavier ones just displace the lighter ones. So how do you know this? I'm not sure I can, you know. It may be, but there's no way for me to test it. How do you know that the heavens are eternal in this way, this is motion? Um, for example, if you look at the mountains, it looks like they've been there forever. When you go close, you can see they've changed. When you read traditions about them, you hear they've changed. If you examine them closely, you can see that there's you know, fossils, there used to be a, a seabed there. He was like a very interesting, uh, almost a geologist. Uh, how do you know? And so he challenged him, and they had bitter exchange. 
uh, and they uh, completely disagreed. One had a more philosophical Aristotelian worldview, the other one was more empirical, uh, almost more in, in touch with the spirit of modern times, as has been said now. At that point in time, he was out of step. Um, and this is in the year Ibn Sina dies, anyone know? 1037, this is a common era. Right? Abu Biruri dies around 1048, right? This station was al Biruri, so it could have been later, but that's about the time. Now Imam al-Ghazali comes. When is he born? Yeah, he, he, he's born in 1055, or 1058, one of the two, I'm sorry, I can't remember. But he dies in 1111, it's easy to remember the date. 1111, one, one, one. And the year 505 of the Hijra. So, so he was also the Mujahid at the turn of the century. Um, people consider him that he would have been the Mujahid of that time. All right. He writes against Ibn Sina also. And he says, look, on he wrote a book called Tahafut al Falasif, right? The refutation or the incoherence of the philosophers. And he says, okay, these are 20 points in which you're deviant. And I'm not going to go into the details of the points. But in these three doctrines, the philosophers are outside the fold of Islam. Because it has to do with the nature of Allah. And what he's trying to do is to preserve the integrity of God's revelation. That if you take the wahi seriously, you cannot believe these things about God that the philosophers do. And what Ibn Sina is saying, that if I use my mind independent of revelation, consistently, I cannot but come to these conclusions about the world. And I have to interpret revelation in light of my reason. There's two different approaches. Both trying to be faithful, he said he believes that intellect is from God as well. Right? But they had different approaches. And they were both uh, extremely smart. And they had great contributions in different areas. Ibn Sina's uh, medicine, book on medicine was studied in Europe until like, the 17th century, right? Okay, so uh, uh, major, major uh, disagreement, right, between Imam al-Ghazali and Ibn Sina. Now, along comes Ibn Rushd in Spain. Imam al-Ghazali was in Baghdad, came from Tus in, in some Persian area. Uh, uh, we know that uh, Ibn Sina and Biruni were from Central Asia, further east. And then Al Biruni eventually goes into Afghanistan, also goes into India. Uh, Ibn Sina comes down into Isfahan. And uh, Imam Ghazali went from Tunis to Baghdad. And that was when the madrasas were being established by the Seljuks, and so on. Um, and then Ibn Rushd comes about a century later in Spain. He dies in 1198. And he decides that he's going to read Aristotle for himself. He doesn't like the refutation. Aristotle is just too smart for that. Uh, the philosophers that based uh, their understanding on Aristotelian or Neo Aristotelian, Neo Platonic um, uh, thought, like thought of Aristotle and Plato that had been formulated by, uh, by theologians and interpreted uh, in the intervening years. They, they, they were too smart for this. So he wanted to reread Aristotle and comment on it. So Ibn Rushd was called the, the second uh, commentator, the commentator. And he wrote a number of interesting books. Uh, he tried to reconcile al Hikmah and Shadiyah. But one of his books is called, remember what Imam Ghazali's book was called? Tahafut al Falasima? Like the incoherence of the philosophers. So Ibn Rushd writes a book, Tahafut at Tahafuts. The incoherence of the incoherence of the philosophers. And he says, you know what? Imam Zali didn't really understand what the philosophers were saying. That's his point. That on these three points, what the philosophers really meant was something else. And uh, uh, I leave those three points uh, again uh, in the background. Uh, very smart man, Ibn Rushd, uh, Averroes, had a tremendous influence on Latin Europe. Uh, he was accused of uh, the double truth theory because he believed that you, 
could find truth both in Revelation and in Lisa. Mm -hmm. And the two didn't conflict. So uh, the double truth uh, theory, and a lot of uh, what we see later on in Aquinas and uh, uh, in European works as they exit the Dark Ages, uh, Ibn, uh, Ibn Rushd Averroes has had a great influence uh, in that. Okay, so now you see Biruni Ibn Sina, Imam Ghazali, Ibn Rushd, uh, Ibn Arabi, completely uh, uh, esoteric view of the cosmos. Wahdatul Wujud. God created the world that he, so he could see himself. And the gazing of yourself, or the contemplation of yourself in yourself is not the same as if you were to do it by gazing at another. And so the totality of, totality of the world reflects God, God's glory back to him. Even though we only see fragments. But the human being has the ability, al-insan al-kamil, to be the perfect mirror within his soul. Yeah? yeah. It was wonderful stuff. Uh, but uh, not everybody liked it. OK? Uh, not everyone really understands it. I'm not sure I do. I do. I do. Although I just pretended like I did. <laughs> like quantum mechanics. <laughs> Can be ex explained by no one to no one. That's what this means to quantum mechanics. Okay, so Ahl al Wujud is kind of like that. And then, uh, you know, other later mystics uh, uh, came up with like Wahdat al Shuhud, different uh, expressions of that uh, idea. And Ibn Rush was highly frustrated with him. I don't remember the exact story, but uh, they had a meeting when uh, Ibn Arabi was a child. Ibn Arabi dies at about 1240. Okay, so you see the, uh, and Ibn Rush died 1198, but they had met when Ibn Arabi was a child. And he was with this child prodigy, and he asked him a question. And so uh, the way that it's described, Ibn Arabi almost smugly so sort of stays silent and then says something contradictory like yes and no. Uh, and it completely irks uh, Ibn Rush and then Ibn Arabi, and it, it, Ibn Arabi himself described it. And then he goes and he does his own thing. I mean, their lives didn't overlap beyond that. Um, and then you have Ibn Taymiyyah. Now, Ibn Rush, Averroes, Spaniard, he believed that logic was the best thing, since I was a sliced bread, but it doesn't come out like this. Logic was what you needed in order to uh, uh, study the world. Okay? Um, God commands, and in fact, logic, learning logic is an obligation. Because it's like wudu. Because God commands that you contemplate the world. And to contemplate the world, you need to use your reason. And the sharpest tool, the art of arts, is, uh, for reasoning, is logic. And so when he had criticism, when he learned this from, say, the Greeks who had done this before and developed it really well, well, you're learning you know, from non-Muslims and Al-Biruni dealt with the same uh, objections from a certain religious mind minded uh, people that obviously were around him because they addressed him. Ibn Rush says, listen, it's a tool. It's like a knife. You don't uh, 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 not buy a knife from a Greek merchant because he's Greek. You buy it from anybody uh, you can if it's a good sharp knife. And in this particular case, yeah, the Greeks worked on this, uh, but it's a tool. And so just like you would buy, if you're slaughtering an animal, you want the sharpest knife, uh, and you would buy it from the Greek merchant if he had the sharper knife. If you need to think and reason about the world, you would use the best uh, tools that you have uh, for reasoning, and those are found in the discipline of logic. And so take them from the Greeks. No problem. It's just a tool applied to the world. And through, uh, uh, now, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah comes and he writes a refutation of logic, of the logicians, rather. 
And he would say that, uh, in my crude understanding, that logic is circular. You observe particulars from the world, you universalize on, on their basis, and then you go to those universals that you have yourself um, fabricated and reason further uh, from them. You never got to anything that was metaphysical, that was divine. That's only from revelation. And don't think your mind can be applied to, to, um, uh, to, to towards uh, speculation in religious matters. This is Ibn Taymiyyah. And so uh, we know that he has a unique place in Muslim intellectual history, even in the Sunni tradition, because of that. Right? They're all different. And if I can sit here and say, wow, what a great tradition we have. We have Ibn Sina, we have Imam Muzali, we have al biruni we have Ibn Rush. In the same breath, I haven't even talked about Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, uh, and Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, Ismaili, and you know, eventually becomes the, uh, uh, the, the most central figure for Imam al uh, on the other hand. You know, we have this amazing, uh, breadth uh, of intellectual achievement, okay? Uh, on the one hand, you have the, uh, uh, what would reason be put in the service of? Is reason independent of revelation? And then whatever we see in revelation, do we reconcile with that? Or does revelation give us basic axioms and truths, and then we put reason in service of legitimizing and, and, and proving those? Wh where do these things belong? What is our understanding of the universe? Is it like Aristotelian cosmology, where the elements and the cosmos uh, they all function a certain way? Or is it more of, uh, is it more empirical than that? What about authority? Uh, does it with the companions of the prophet and the consensus of the community? Or does it lie with a charismatic lineage that descends from the Prophet. So you have these differences, right? Now, what do we do with them? And what do we do have a liberal arts college? Right? <laughs> we were at Zaytuna. So we have, um, uh, you know, Islam, uh, Sunni creed, and the transmission of that creed. And at the college, we have to teach that creed, both law and theology, and we have to ground students. But we may have in the classroom people who don't believe that creed, who have slightly different understanding of that creed. What about non-Muslims? Hey, 7% of Loyola is, Je is Muslim, <laughs> Jesuit, right? Maybe some days in Tuna we'll have lots of Jesuit students. What are we going to do? How will we teach them? Right? <laughs> right? It's not the case right now. Um, so those are uh, uh, questions that we have. And um, I think uh, uh, some tentative uh, ways to think about it, because uh, you know, thanks to Leif, I, I started thinking about this thing. And let me just conclude with a few words here, and then we can have a good discussion. About it. So one is the recognition of this, this great uh, bread. And we have to acknowledge it. Se second, uh, it's built on a deep respect for learning. And knowledge. And Franz Rosenthal, have you who's heard of Franz Rosenthal? Oh, no. Franz Rosenthal. Habe ich mit in Deutsch studiert. Deutsche Professoren. Trying to say I studied with German professor. Franz Rosenthal passed away. I didn't study with him. Although at my first barbecue at Yale, uh, he was there. And little did I know that I wish I had taken a photograph of him. Because he's this amazing, uh, prolific and uh, mind. He wrote this book called um, uh, Knowledge Triumphant. And in that book, he argues that if civilizations have defining characters, characteristics, or features, then the defining the hallmark of Islamic civilization was its, its, pursuit of, in its pursuit of knowledge. 
and where it plays knowledge in its civilization, its central place. This is his observation after years of, of, uh, of study from outside the tradition. Okay? And um, uh, okay, so Western tradition, sacred knowledge. We at say Tuna College, you know, we have a certain we, if you can say we picked a line, I would say it's probably the Imam Ghazali line. He was the great synthesizer uh, of Sunni thought, law and theology, and mysticism or Sufism. Okay, and uh, he has great influence uh, at the college and in, in the works that we read, and um, uh, and the instructors who uh, who teach. Uh, that being said. Almost, if I would dare to say, you know, no Ibn Sina, no Ghazali. Right? It, maybe it's not a good thing to say. Like, he would have been something else, maybe as great, but not in the way we know. You follow? And so, uh, uh, he was in a, in a deeply troubled environment in Baghdad. Uh, you had uh, Fatimid you know, rivalry in, from Cairo. Um, uh, great instability. The Crusades were coming in, although it probably had very little impact on what was happening uh, in his immediate life at that time. It's only in historical hindsight that we view it. Um, and he was just at the beginning uh, of, of that whole uh, episode. Uh, but he, he, he has this whole intellectual, cultural milieu that gives birth to him. Okay, and that he engages. Now, we regardless of which line we tend to follow, Biruni, and they're not all mutually exclusive, Ibn Sina, Ghazali, we have to recognize that we contribute toward, to each other's greatness, and to the greatness of that, of that legacy. And then if we think, wither the, the greatness of Islam, it's not going to be by uh, ignoring, or wiping out, or completely delegitimizing one, but in creatively engaging the different interpretive trends that we find in Islam. And in knowing ourselves, so we know ourselves as a part of this uh, intellectual tradition. We want to further that intellectual tradition. And if I can read here from a tradition from our education philosophy in the catalog, this is uh, a quote from Martin Van Doren, who wrote liberal education. He had great influence on uh, uh, at least Sheikh Hamza. You know, Sheikh Hamza's name is Mark Van Mark Hansen. He was named after Mark Van Doren. Um, so, where is this quote? Uh, Our goal is to make Zaytuna a place where Muslim tradition comes alive. Tradition, as Van Doren reminds us, is most dangerous and most troublesome when it is forgotten. It gives strength as well as takes it. It brings life as well as threatens it. It is life fighting to maintain itself in time. It is life fighting to maintain itself in time. For there is the curious fact that tradition is never so healthy as when it is being fought. We deny its authority, but in doing so, we use its clearest terms. And in the end, if we are original in enriching it, so that it may strengthen, uh, it may strengthen, uh, uh, no, so that it may have strength for future wars. It is orthodoxy at its best, thriving on heresies, which it digests into nobler problems. Follow? It is orthodoxy at its best, thriving on heresies which it digests into nobler problems. And so, if we're going to you know, do anything meaningful in the present world, uh, it's not going to be through a break in, with the past. It's going to be through an appropriation of the past and a co continue, continuation of it. And if we, if we term all of the uh, approaches that um, fall within the uh, 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 different uh, interpretations of, of that tradition broadly defined, if we say those, those are heresies, then, then this particular tradition will 
will grow through a healthy engagement with those other persuasions. But they're all needed for the strength of this one. And the others would view it uh, hopefully in the same way. You see? So you can embrace that diversity, but without uh, falling into the trap of complete relativism. You can still affirm your identity and hopefully perpetuate um, the legacy that, that was. Um, one of the things that um, we like to do is um, is draw a comparison with, um, with, you know, or place ourselves within Western intellectual tradition also. Um, if you look at the great books of Western civilization, um, that's, a, that's a collection that was put out by Encyclopedia Britannica. They have a nice timeline. And they, they uh, start from way back the Greeks, and then they come all the way to St. Augustine. And then there's a break from about the year 400 to the year 1200. Aquinas, and then they continue to modern beer. And that's us. And we were part of the same conversation. It's just that, uh, and we enriched what came afterwards. And so part of what the college does is it uh, affirms its place in, in intellectual history um, and in world history. Um, as far as the liberal arts go, the way that, the, uh, that this is still a liberal arts college at its core is that the disciplines that lie at the heart of our tradition, the transmitted tradition, are the same as the ones that lie at the heart of the Western liberal arts tradition in the classical sense. And those are um, uh, the tools that free the mind and allow you to think. Language, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So what do we mean when we use a word, what's the concept that we're referring to? How do we persuade others? How do we communicate our ideas? How do we uh, arrange the words in order to make it most uh, lucid and coherent? This is, uh, uh, and this is what texts are. It's words that signify concepts. It's what revelation is. And the Muslims were masters of, of language. And this is also at the heart of the Western liberal uh, arts tradition. Uh, at its core. Uh, if you look at even things like um, the SAT, uh, you know, the, the whole verbal and uh, analytical uh, aspects of it are uh, part of that uh, liberal arts tradition, the trivium. And the liberal arts also had the quantitative aspect, the prodrivium, um, which included you know, arithmetic, geometry, uh, astronomy, and music. Uh, and you can look at those as you know, numbers in space, uh, numbers in an abstract sense, which is arithmetic, numbers in space, which is geometry, uh, numbers in the heavens, like in the cosmos, which is astronomy, uh, or in space-time, uh, and then numbers in time, but in harmony uh, with, uh, with music. So we don't do music, it's not part of the curriculum, but we do have mathematics and astronomy, and the mathematics has um, both arithmetic uh, as well as um, Geometry. Um, so we try to cover those liberal arts. We give the students the tools to think for themselves, while we also initiate them within uh, a given tradition. And then, uh, you know, hopefully we cut them loose. And then, um, uh, if any of them go on to become uh, Ibn Sina or Ghazali or Biruni or Ibn Rush, uh, that's uh, between them and their Lord. And I believe um, that they will be. In Um, I hope that, uh, 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 what's a Zaytuna scholar? That was the, <laughs> that was the question. Um, I hope that, that answers the question. Uh, thank you very much for your all, all your attention. We're open to discussion. Q and A. Pablo. So uh, I just wanted to ask that, uh, like the sphere of public engagement, like if you had, say, like, um, you know, and uh, was that healthy engagement, but then sometimes they didn't have to point, like, they said, like you said, they said, you know, out of the fullness of 
So how can you get or where or how can you get or can you get from there <laughs> to the other four or five? That all seems kind of easy. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I mean, they uh, they weren't uh, face to face, and um, uh, it didn't have uh, you know, the, uh, the consequences that would uh, proceed from if they were in the same community and being schismatic. Um, although you could argue that it, it did have that if, uh, if they're philosophers in the community to follow one or another. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess it wasn't always uh, hunky-dory, right? And uh, a lesson from that is that it, it could get ugly uh, uh, now as well. Uh, but still, there's, I think, a larger lesson to draw from that is uh, keep it in perspective. So stick to your convictions, but recognize that that uh, tension afforded you the opportunity to clear your own understanding. I have a follow-up and kind of follow up on your state of convictions. Uh, you said that Satan was more than the Salvador. Yes. So how come you decided to yeah. Well, it's the founders. The founders who, uh, who founded the institution. Yeah. They set the trajectory. And so then they hired people uh, of, of like mind, especially initially. Mm -hmm. um, or why they, they chose that one? Well, that's their conviction. They went and studied. And also, um, uh, I mean, I don't want to uh, make too many claims, but that happens to be um, the Sunni Ash'ari position, uh, a majority position in the Muslim world. So when they, uh, two of them are converts, uh, they converted, they sought out Islam, and they found themselves in the heartlands of the Muslim world, and that's what they ended up studying. Um, it also happens to be uh, quite persuasive, uh, intellectually, um, and they're sharp people. So. Um, you know that's what they, they follow, and then uh, the core faculty, at least those that teach theology and law, you know, have to be on on, on the same wavelength as it is in, in theology departments and other religious institutions. Like I know at the University of Notre Dame, where I taught, um, they had over 50 faculty in the theology department, the largest department on campus, and all but two or three were Catholic, or they were all Christian majority. And uh, the mandatory theology classes will only be taught by Catholics. So, um, you know, it'll be something similar uh, at Zaytuna when it comes to Sunni uh, theology. Uh, but the classroom will nonetheless welcome and hopefully be intellectually honest when it engages other, other positions, especially historically, inshallah. Yeah. And, and also respectful. So, it won't uh, make someone who's a little bit persuasion. But there are people who say you would understand the differences. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so just to clarify, uh, Imam Ghazali's position uh, was that if your reason went against revelation or went contrary to revelation, uh, then you're basically outside of the fold of Islam. No. On, on three points. Would you, I know I know you kind of uh, were mysterious yeah. about those three points, but do you mind like expanding? Yeah. On? Okay. So, one uh, one was the eternity of the world. This idea that the world uh, created world didn't have a beginning; that it's always been there, and God has always been creator. The second was on the resurrection of the bodies. That uh, the philosophers believe the bodies perished; it was the soul that went on, immaterial. And he thought that. Um, these, these were against clear statements in Revelation that speak of bodily resurrection. And so you can't uh, come to those conclusions. Um, and what was the third, anybody remember? Bodily resurrection, eternity of the world, and yeah, God's knowledge of uh, particulars. So you know there's universals and particulars. So uh, in a platonic world of ideas, um, this concept of redness, like what is it that makes something essentially red? And then that in this world, we see particular reds, like the remorse on your shirt, or you know, uh, some, this red, right? Uh, a triangle, like in this world, there's no perfect triangle. If you go close enough to anyone, you find a, 
thought. But then there is a distinct this idea of triangle to the essence. So uh, if God knew the particulars of the world, um, his knowledge would change uh, as he interacted with those. That was for him impossible. So he, I mean, they have reasons for this, um, which the theologians engaged also rationally. Um, so he said, no, uh, God knows everything. Don't limit his knowledge to just universal uh, concepts. And it's very clear from the So he was preserving the, the, you know, the literal sense of revelation and not uh, uh, willing to allow God to be defined or limited or uh, through a, a re rational process that uh, disregards the letter of, of revelation, especially in terms of how God described himself. Yeah. yeah that I feel like that gives a better perspective, and, and now we know why Ghazali said what he did. Yeah, and he also he he first wrote Maqasid al Falasba, which is very interesting for us. Uh, you know, if you're trying to refute somebody, uh, he didn't just start out going, you know, refuting the philosophers. He first stated very clearly what their beliefs were, and. Um, uh, he did it in a way that a philosopher would pick it up and say, yeah, that's pretty good. That's what I believe. So he, uh, you know, he, um, he let them know that he understood what they believed before he started to challenge them. And we have a problem with that. I think sometimes uh, we, speaking generally, uh, if we're in, a, in, a, in an adversarial uh, conversation or debate, we don't always understand fully what the other party might be saying. We project onto them what we think. That's not what he did. Yeah, um, I had a question about the Buddha College itself. Like, so, say like someone wanted to like go over there and learn, and uh, what kind of background in Islamic knowledge do they need beforehand to be successful? Like, None. Like, like <laughs> zero. Instead of that, <laughs> we have uh, new converts who come, and we've got Mufad. <coughs> Come. Uh, you have to know Arabic, and so it's, there's five years of Arabic that we do in a four-year college. How, how do we do that? Uh, we have one year prerequisite, and so if you get admitted and you have no Arabic, you're required to take a summer Arabic intensive prior to matriculation, and then you come in with that year, and then you do four more years. Yeah, but we take everybody through. <coughs> how many years is it? You know, um, it's not as rigorous as we'd like it to be. It's still, uh, and it's somewhat self-selecting. Like, uh, we get students who are interested in that particular kind of study. So, um, um, uh, and we're in, you know, we're, we're in the process of, uh, we're going through the accreditation process. And so, uh, I think a lot of people are waiting for that. And the parents won't allow them to go, first of all, to, uh, you know, study Islamic law and theology. Although uh, in our curriculum, you know, we have eight, like five years of Arabic, eight classes in law, uh, three in theology, uh, two in Quran, uh, prophetic tradition, uh, uh, prophetic biography, uh, the soul and the cosmos, which is where this misses the soul class. And then, uh, but we also have, um, uh, you know, history of science, astronomy, mathematics, ethics, politics. Economics, uh, contemporary uh, issues of Muslim law, uh, the rise and fall of civilization, like philosophy and history class. We have uh, three classes in logic, uh, rhetoric, uh, freshman seminar, um, how to read and understand. So it, it is a liberal art in the curriculum, and um, some of those um, classes are taught by people of different traditions. Um, like I said, we have Catholics on campus. We want to do is graduate people who can think for themselves, but nonetheless are grounded in one tradition, and then they can go from there where, where they wish. Nobody here? What's your name? I'm curious, um, how do you um, prepare students to enter the 
engage in interfaith dialogues with other faiths? Oh, you know, that's a really good question. We don't. Uh, we have a class in world religions. Okay. Um, but we don't really work on interfaith dialogue. Um, we had a, and it's interesting because we're on this place called Holy Hill. We haven't moved there yet. Uh, we purchased very really nice buildings. It looks like this, uh, right at the heart of Holy Hill. Yeah, and it's called Holy Hill because it's um, a consortium of uh, seminaries um, that occupy that place. And it's like a 10 minute walk from East Berkeley Library. It's a fantastic neighborhood. Uh, and so it's a very interfaith environment. Um, but those are mostly the graduate uh, seminaries. Uh, but nonetheless, being in that environment, they have lots of opportunities for interfaith uh, interaction and conversation. And the way that uh, I've tried to explain it before, we were at the Baptist Seminary and had a dialogue with them, is our philosophy is uh, know thyself. So uh, when you when you encounter the other, uh, you know yourself deeply. You know you will hopefully be able to understand another uh, equally deeply. Uh, and we have have a richer exchange uh, because of it. So I'm not sure exactly how that will play out, but I think um, uh, time will tell in the next few years, depending on how the interactions uh, go. We may give more structure to it, especially as we start to define our undergraduate program, which we haven't done yet, but maybe in the next decade. Okay. Yeah, I'm just seeing in general it's an important thing to have because you know, every day we face different people with different things. Yes. I think a lot of us lack the knowledge of how to effectively right. you know, engage in the dialogue. Yeah, that's very important. And um, uh, right now, we don't have a structure for it, but we decided to you know, uh, dive in head first by putting ourselves on the hill in Berkeley, which is an extremely vibrant uh, you know, cultural and intellectual uh, uh, city. And so they're having interactions all the time. Yeah, we didn't want to be isolated. There were many cheaper places to go in the country, uh, you know, far away, in isolation, kind of dreamy. You know, but you know, they wanted to be in, in the thick of it, or as it's almost like to say, in the thick of it. <laughs> <laughs> conversation that we have a lot at Zaytuna. Um, if you feel that everything you think of is a projection of your own mind, so it's subjective, you make your own reality. And in some way, there's no real objective reality other than whatever you can convince each other of through convention and what is useful for communication between people. That's a very different kind of worldview to what the, the ancients had, which is that, no, we can understand essences. We can have concepts that are universal and real. And when we reason in reference to them, um, we are uh, reasoning with reality. And, uh, our knowledge is what corresponds with that reality. So they're two different worldviews. One, and, and so uh, it's almost your tradition will become incomprehensible in the context of modern nominalist philosophical uh, worldview. And uh, that's something we recognize, and we invite our students to recognize. And then uh, uh, you know, recognition is the first step to uh, constructive engagement. And so we have to do a lot of constructive theology, I think, uh, in order to make our tradition uh, comprehensible in the modern world. 
And I think uh, a lot of people don't realize uh, that. And so, uh, a number of, we were talking earlier of our traditional you know, theologians, what we consider what we call today philosophers of science, is how they deal with reality, how they deal with nature, and how they dealt with it in the past. And uh, they observe the world uh, really carefully, and their theology was crafted uh, through careful understanding of, 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 of the creative uh, order. And uh, today our understanding of that reality is, is uh, we've, we've got a lot more knowledge, or maybe a different kind of knowledge about the world, but our theology hasn't really been, uh, I don't want to say changed, but yeah, you know, uh, engage that uh, in, in, in creative ways here. You know, our theologians should be quantum physicists uh, or evolutionary biologists. Biologists, <laughs> right? And then they need to uh, make sense of, of their text in light of what they're seeing in the world. Literature. I have a few more uh, here. Um, if anyone wants to uh, to see something about the college, our website is abysmal. We're very embarrassed about it, <laughs> so I, you know it has to be, uh, and uh, we all know it. And it's one of those incomprehensible things. It's like we all know. So this is such an important thing. The whole world sees us do it, and just nobody sees it. So we know it. So uh, I tell them. I left some catalog earlier. I have plenty of here, so if you would like. And if anybody's going to be in Berkeley, May 18th, uh, I can give you an invitation to our uh, first uh, commencement. We're graduating at uh, class. So I left some cards earlier as well uh, at the Juma. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's going to take you to know. And you don't need the card. I mean, you can online, but if you want the card, <laughs> no. In fact, we're going to like shake your pockets for our nation. <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, just a reminder, everyone. I just wanted to make this announcement that May 10th.